All right, so welcome to our July uh, book club discussion. So this summer, we are, uh, our theme is physics. It's a little bit of a departure for us as a microbiology book club or a biology, more generally biology book club. We've, we've, uh, we've busted out and we're, we're talking about physics. Our June discussion was on a book by Katie Mack called The End of Everything Astrophysically Speaking. And our July discussion today is going to be on this book, The Disordered Cosmos, uh, by Chanda Prescott Weinstein. And I think I have said that correctly. I know it's not Shanda because I went looking on YouTube to find how she says it. And I found an interview where they were calling her Shanda at the beginning. And she very like assertively, and I was like, oh, that was impressive. She just like jumps right in and goes, nope, it's not Shanda, it's Chanda. And I was like, Okay, I think I'm saying that correctly, yes. So, and I thought, oh good. Um, so this, the, the way this book is structured, it's got, it's, it's structured in four phases. So I think what we're gonna do is, is split it up a little bit. Um, but before we get started, let's just go ahead and do some introductions of ourselves. Uh, so I'm Laura Williams. I'm uh, now an associate professor of biology at Providence College in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, and this is my seventh year leading the book club. Um, and if you're watching this, we absolutely would be delighted to have you join us. We're always glad to have new returning intermittent people uh, come and talk about books with us. Uh, next to me in the gallery, I've got Nicole. Nicole, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes. Hello, I'm Nicole Sucleo, and I tweet on Twitter as Old Dusty, and I will be teaching about tree diseases in the fall at the University of Northern British Columbia in Prince George, British Columbia, Canada. And in the winter, I'll be teaching about things that have more than one cell, which I've never taught before to first year biology students. So that's where I'm at. It's gonna be exciting. Yeah. <laughs> We're all just gonna get through it. <laughs> um, and then Joan, <clears throat> excuse me, Joan, do you wanna introduce yourself? I'm Joan, I'm retired. I'm Laura's mother. I feel very uh, privileged to be able to participate in these discussions and get my mind expanded, even though sometimes what I'm reading, I don't understand that much. So I come to learn. So thank you for having me. Absolutely. No, we're, it's always great to have. And I mean, this is a good example of, I'm, I'm always happy to have, um, we end up with a lot of scientists in the book club, which is fantastic, but I'm always happy to, happy to have interested folks who don't have uh, the same type of science background. And so that's, you know, that's why Joan is a good, a good participant. And if there's anyone else who happens to be watching this, who thinks, oh, I'm not a practicing scientist, um, that should not at all be a barrier to you joining us. We would love to have you. And I, I paused a little bit there because I was thinking, oh, that idea about who is a scientist is something I want to talk about from, from, from this book. So we'll, we'll get back to that too, because I think that's definitely relevant. Um, okay, so I, I think what, I, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about, th this book is split up into four phases. And phase one is just physics. This is very, a very honest <laughs> title for that one. Um, phase two is physics and the chosen few. Phase three is the trouble with physicists. And phase four is all our galactic relations. And so to me as a reader, I felt like phase one was as promised, much more focused on the science of, of physics and cosmology. It echoed some of the things we'd seen um, in Katie Mack's book, expanded on them in different ways, gave different interpretations of, of, of certain things. And then the other three phases are uh, dig into kind of the social context of how physics is practiced in Western science, how science in, in the West is practiced, um, representation, inclusion, things that are different than inclusion that I wanna get to. Um, and so I think maybe what we might wanna do is start with phase one and just talk a little bit about the, the, the physics part and then let ourselves kind of expand into the other parts of the book and give ourselves some time to talk about, about that. So um, with that in mind, uh, general thoughts from you folks on 
the first phase of the book, just physics. It's a very open-ended way to open that. So I'll start here. And I think I've been thinking a lot about, I mean, recently, meaning in the last three hours, about why the book was structured the way it was. <laughs> And the thing about the first chapter is it is kind of great, especially coming off of Dr. Max's book that Dr. Prescott Weinstein kind of brings us more into what happened after the first few seconds of the, the big expansion. So like understanding that we actually had things that now resembled the atomic nuclei that we learn about in our high school undergraduate chemistry about 400,000 years afterwards, the things were cool enough that we could we could get stuff like that. So understanding baryogenesis. But even though this is sort of the just physics uh, section, from a very autobiographical and also within the discipline perspective, this was an important chapter to understand what drew Chanda to the discipline. And I think that's also really key to just see, um, you know, that this is a scientist who is drawn to a community that's passionate about all the same things, you know, uh, while also having to contend with the barriers that her identity and, you know, living in the society that we do that is founded on settler colonialism has imposed. So the other thing that I really appreciated was the care she took with um, fulfilling or it filling in details of identity for other scientists that she mentioned, such as the uh, the deaf hard of hearing identity of Levitt and the, the you know the important work that um, I have his name on Wikipedia. I've bookmarked some of these people that I was forgetting. Elmer Imes is a key black scientist um, that was uh, collecting important spectral data to support quantum theory. So uh, even though it is just physics, the consciousness of who was contributing and where they were situated in how Western physics hierarchy called people by title was, is still something that was, that was acknowledged. Yeah, I agree. I think, I think uh, it is, uh, it is, there are parallels between the first book that we read and, and this this first section of this book, the lens is is different, and so it's <clears throat> Nicole, like you said, it's there's a autobiographical quality to like explaining how she came to to where she is in her career now, uh, why she's excited about this, and and it <clears throat> she mentions this again later. The idea of part of what you want all people to be able to pursue, but particularly from her perspective when she's describing this as a scientist, is you want you don't want to uh, you don't want to uh, lose sight of the joy that you have about why you are interested in a field, um, and and everyone everyone knows that there are always lots of friction points and barriers and challenges that try to kind of sap your your joy away from you in various ways, and part of that comes from the structures that we're forced into. Um, but it's, 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 to me, it kind of felt like partially an exercise for her to kind of try to return back to, this is the thing that I got excited about as, as a little girl. This is the thing that was really exciting to me as a child. This is, I remain excited about this. Um, and I think that that came through with this, the, the wonder that you have about the the workings of the cosmos, which is pretty lofty and, and awesome. Well, and it's also just, I think the one thing that in Dr. Mack's book that comes through also is um, that the discipline itself, this is also pragmatically an important chapter because it gives the reader the toolbox to understand the ideas of physics that are interweaved in the remaining four sections. But it's a discipline of possibility. So I mean, a lot of the graphs where it's just like, well, we don't actually know, ideally we want these lines to converge and let these two items be predictable off of each other. I don't remember which graph it was, but like there's one with a dotted line and a solid line. So it's about relationships that we're still trying to hypothesize or that in that discipline, there are hypotheses and trying to find evidence through data collected 
by looking at the sky, obviously, from a cosmological perspective. And I think that's also just um, another part that's that's all as emotional as it is understanding what physicists do, because um, their methods of collecting evidence require so much other underlying assumptions of looking at the past, which in and of itself is just a very, very interesting uh, thing. So even arrangements of matter, like everything is about arrangements that are hypothesized. And this is skipping ahead a bit, but like it kind of helped me understand why <laughs> I've had frustrations with talking to other physics majors about the way that they set up describing items and 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 of course uh, dr prescott weinstein also mentions that the matter that composes us and the arrangements of matter we're familiar with are actually odd in terms of prevalence in the universe there's more other stuff invisible matter right so there's a section in the melanin chapter where this line it's just been rattling around in my head for weeks where uh dr prescott weinstein refers to melanin's biosynthesis is believed to be catalyzed by enzymes. So it's not even that the enzyme exists as an objective entity. It's a hypothesized arrangement of matter, one that we study very well from our biological training. But like, even that comes in. And it's just like, well, I kind of have to accept that now that you've done such a good job of explaining where the legacies of the world and atomic structure that, that we choose to kind of deal with as more concrete than an assumption are. I'm rambling a bit, so I'll stop here. No, I, I think I, I think I know where you're going with that. Yeah, that's it's a, and she talks about later in the book like ways of knowing, you know, and 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 there's a discussion there about contrasting kind of Western science as an edifice with with other ways of knowing. But even within the practice of Western science, there's I think Nicole kind of what you're might be talking about is that if you take a biologist and you take a physicist and you put them in the room together, they're going to come at things from a slightly different framework, a slightly different perspective. Um, you know, if you told a biologist like, well, your hypothesis that this enzyme exists, biologists would be like, I mean, it's an enzyme, it's there. You can do the reaction and you see the thing produce. Like, what are you talking about? My hypothesis that this enzyme is produced. Um, but yeah, that's, it's, it help, you're right, it helps kind of set up how physicists think about things, or at least in this case, this, this group of physicists. Um, I see Luke's popped in. Hello, Luke, how are you? He's upside down. No, he's correct again. <laughs> Hi, I'm good. I'm listening on my phone, so my angle is a little weird. No problem, no problem. Um, we are, just to kind of bring you up to speed, we just got started and we decided we were going to talk about the first phase of the book, the just physics phase at first, and then kind of talk about the other three phases of the book, which were a bit more about kind of social context and of, of physics and so forth, because it seems like that was a, a, a separation point, I think, for some of the content. Um, Joan, I, I wanted to pop over to you because I'd, I'd, I'd asked about um, how, how what general impressions about this first first phase of the book. Did you, from your perspective as a as a non non scientist, what did you think? When I'm I listen to the audio book, I also got the hard copy. But when I'm listening, I usually have a relative idea of what she's talking about but I can say it doesn't stick with me. If I actually wanted to know this, I'd have to sit down with the book and take notes and then look it back over because I'm always doing something else while I'm listening. But I thought she was very good at, at explaining. <clears throat> I also thought it was interesting talking about her background and how she developed this love for physics uh, at such an early age or the cosmos. And also makes you wonder how many individuals that are truly gifted that we never get to hear from because nobody ever helps them and gives them the opportunity to expand upon the gift they have. Because when you are, in my opinion, it's nature or nurture. 
So if you naturally have some ability, that's wonderful. But if you don't have opportunity to be nurtured and to progress in that field and have somebody support you, then you may never get to use those gifts. So I thought that was interesting. And I also thought in the first section, uh, like Nicole, when you were talking about people she referred to, it's amazing the detail and how easily she wove in all the <clears throat> research that other people did that to contributed to where we are in this uh, knowledge of physics. Uh, and also, I'm not sure where in the book, maybe somebody else remembers, she did um, give a call out uh, to Katie Mack that she, I heard her name in there that yes, you know, her book and she seemed it was a positive call out. So those were my thoughts on the first section. Yeah, thank you. Luke, did you wanna did you wanna jump in here? I don't want to put you on the spot since you just popped in. No, that's fine. I actually um, the way Joan described uh, like listening to the first part, I really connected to because I also listened to it. I feel like in the moment I understood what she was saying, but I listened to it last last week, um, and I can't for the life of me describe the like the first really physics heavy part in detail like I, I in the moment I was like oh yeah I'm understanding this a little more like with the Katie Mac book in the moment I was like I don't think I'm understanding this when I was listening to it whereas with this one I, I felt like I was picking up what she was putting down but I don't remember it. I didn't retain any of it which I think is more uh, again kind of like what John was saying I was walking the dog and doing dishes and whatever so it, it speaks more to how I was consuming it versus the writing or anything like that uh, I did I but I did find this because I've read a lot of physics books because it's a field I really struggle with. So I'm like, oh, I should try to better understand this. I found this to be one of the most accessible of the physics books that I've read or listened to. Yeah, I was, I was thinking to myself when I was reading the first section, I was thinking, okay, I feel like some of this I, some of this I got with the previous book. Some of this I'm, I'm getting, I'm like, boy, if I just keep reading these, then you know, 17 months from now, <laughs> I'm going to have it down, <laughs> um, which maybe is still ambitious, but, uh, but yeah. So um, I think that maybe what we want to do, yeah, go ahead. I just want to say really quick, Luke, I like the reader on this book too. I don't know if you have an opinion. Uh, I like the reader on this book better than the Katie Mac uh, reader. I don't know why, there was just something about the intonation of her voice. I don't know. I just, it may, I, I was more receptive to it. Yeah, it was definitely a good narrator. I don't, I don't uh, remember having an opinion on uh, the Katie Mack book, but this one, I think I've listened to a few of the books that she's narrated and she does a good job. You're right. Boy, that's such an important part of the audiobook. I wonder how much control the author has over that, because that could really affect how your work is received, is who's who's uh, reading it. I don't know if they have a say over, but it makes or breaks an audiobook for sure. Like I, I think lots of good books get ruined when they have a bad narrator. Yeah, I'm just there's a pop in to say that I have also been consuming the audiobook for this particular book club title. And I agree that this uh I feel like whatever the narrator did to prep for this delivery, they reflected upon the emotional weight of certain sections of this book and also kind of really thought about what, what that author was bringing in terms of experiences and things they wanted to emphasize. Yeah, that's a whole, that's a fascinating you could get into a whole thing about like audiobook and how you do it in the the art of of narrating an audiobook there's probably a, a range of skill level for people well i think there's some big parallels here to when we talk about is lecture effective for teaching versus taking in the text i mean i think a lot of what we're echoing is that it's really hard to deal with new ideas when they're just being spoken at you but we yeah. do have the luxury of rewinding these right um and the engagement piece is there I think Joan, Luke, and myself are all kind of converging on that point with respect to 
to the rhetorical skill of that narrator. Yeah, yeah, I should I should go look for a sample of it so I can kind of hear how it, how it sounds. Um, okay, so uh, one of the things that I, and this, this is a way of kind of transitioning into phase two, three, and four of the book, which uh, gets more into kind of the social context of how, how, how physics is practiced in the West. Um, but I, I really liked that even in this first phase, you know, your, your chapter titles are things like, I love quarks, which is great, but then dark matter isn't dark space-time isn't straight, you know, the biggest picture there is. So she's she's already kind of pulling in ideas about trying to challenge assumptions of how science is and who scientists are. And one of the one of the one of the things that really struck me from this section that I think leads into the other sections really well is when she's talking about um, quantum chromodynamics. And I, I'm trying to find the, yeah, here it is. So quantum chromodynamics, and she starts to explain the idea that people, I'm gonna get this totally wrong, but we're gonna go for it. So scientists in an effort to explain states of, of these particular like quantum particles assigned color to them. And they assigned color to them in a way that the colors are supposed to be able to combine to give you an outcome. And she's very, very explicit to say, this is just a thing that, this is just a labeling system that we have slapped onto these particles. These particles do not have color. This is not anything to do with whether this particle is, is black, this particle is white, you know, it doesn't, how these particles combine to give you an outcome that that is just a labeling system that scientists used to try to kind of describe these properties or these states and it's got baked into it a lot of our assumptions about the the value of white or black and it and i thought to myself god that's such a great example when people try to say you know oh, you've got, you know, politics is never gets into science or at it, its purest science doesn't, doesn't, doesn't have these issues. You're like, are you kidding me? Because this is an example of something where somebody said, oh yeah, we're going to just basically take the description of these particles and we're going to just cook into it the labeling system. A lot of assumptions that were very much not self-examined by whoever came up with the system of quantum chromodynamics and the labeling. Um, I, that really, that really stuck with me throughout the rest of the book. Cause I think I probably read this section maybe two and a half, three weeks ago. And it was still, it was still like really present in my mind as a, a pretty striking example of how this stuff leaks in. Even if you consider yourself objective, even if you consider yourself removed from it, the, the, the kind of assumptions from society and the way, the way we kind of are, are acculturated to think about things just leaks into all of this stuff even when you're even when you're not aware of it um i don't know if anybody else remembered running across that that bit yeah i i, I was struck by that too and i really like because that i feel like that's a big point that she's trying to make is how science isn't just in a vacuum how it shapes society and society shapes science. And I think she explicitly said that um, in the book. And I think that's really important for scientists to acknowledge. Um, and so we can do exactly like what she did in this book, decipher some of these biases in research. Uh, I, I, I thought that was really cool. And like, I, I think sometimes there's a little bit of a, and, and it might be like a defensive streak in scientists where like they would hear an argument like she's making and they would say, no, no, it's just like innocuous color assignment. It doesn't mean anything. Uh, but like all of those prejudices that are built into our society, are like, cause science is part of society, it's, they're gonna be built into the scientific research as well. So I, I don't think it's fair to say like, no, no, it has nothing to do with 
these giant social issues that are facing all of us, but, you know, so yeah, I also, that, I also like that. I'm just trying to think of what I would do if I was introduced to quantum chromodynamics in a university classroom and the difference between a lecturer who would actually be very transparent about the fact that the the color designators are nothing more than a way to indicate difference as opposed to somebody who just said this is how you are going to learn this because I think there's this other piece it's not just um Clearly, what should be central is the fact that it does provide these connotative values to color that we assign to valuation and other things. But like, I, another thing that kind of gets built up in that first section of the book is the way physicists like to name things. And without separating for scientists and students, what is a name for a name for categorization? And what is a name that has an underlying mechanistic significance or something that you need to actually be able to explain to know? As a student who doesn't see herself yet as empowered within an educational system or in a system of study, if you're too afraid to ask, is this a knowledge gap that remains there? Because instructors and physicists choose not to be explicit about what this is. How much of the language that they come up with is actually just there to make even more intricate you know, the way that their discourse proceeds. So that's the other thing I think about is like, you know, it's good. Uh, it is great that that explanation came from Dr. Prescott Weinstein because I'd never heard of quantum chromodynamics. And there is like, it is a little like pulling back the curtain on the Wizard of Oz to be like, they're just names, yo. Like, we kind of need that in science because it helps with, with, understanding why we've done categorization the way we have and when there's significance attached to it and when there's not and not being transparent about that is another thing that happens in academic systems that sometimes leaves us feeling like we know less than we actually do well and nicole along what you were saying it is can someone ask a question because it's who is your professor or your lecturer because she, I, I got the impression reading this too, she felt inadequate when she got to Harvard, even though she had a lot of knowledge and love for her subject, she realized that people coming from other places have had a lot more educational background in their high school and you know what was supplemented to them and oh. I think I lost my train of thought. Something else you were uh, talking about. Oh, yeah, with her being afraid. Oh, forgot that, lost the rest of the train of thought. So, but I agree with you, Nicole. I think those are really good points. But I think, you know, and, and Joan, you, you, your background from college is an education degree and you taught little kids for some time. So, you know, I mean, the, the, for those of us who are in the classroom or have been in the classroom, the idea of trying to extend ourselves to consider where our students are coming from and that they could be coming from a different place than we have even thought of, I think is, is a good thing to think about and a good thing to consider how best to approach that. So how to, because how to, you can't necessarily interpret or be prepared for every single perspective that your students are going to be coming from every single question they might have. So, so to some degree, I think it's part of it is trying to signal that you are open to people asking questions and that you won't cut them off immediately if you, if you get flustered or you don't feel like you know where they're coming from or you start to, to the question starts to lead into somewhere that's making you uncomfortable that you're not just like, well, I don't know what you're talking about with that. It's all very clear. You know, uh, the idea that you're like, okay, well, let's let's develop this. Like, what are you what are you asking about here? Um, I think that's important too. I don't know, Mom. I think I saw you do a little. I thought of the thing I was going to say. Did you think of it? Yes, yeah, right along the lines you were talking about. Because when you are teaching, there is so much information you have to get out there. You know that you have to. And you might know the not know the answer to the question that they're, they're asking, and so, and the different levels exactly where you took it, Laura. Thank you. 
Yeah. So I so I think that idea gets us into the 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 next three sections, which talk a lot more about how physics is situated in society, um, her experience of physics, and then also kind of trying to envision a new way of practicing science. Um, and for me, I think there were there were two major things that came out of this for me that I that I felt like were really striking. And one was she's very uh, thoughtful about who is practicing science, who is doing science, who is a scientist. And the other thing that that came out to me is. I mean, to some degree, she's really asking for a complete and total rethinking of the structures around science and the structures around academia and the structures around production of knowledge, distribution of knowledge. That's a, that's a really big thing. Um, yeah, th those are two thoughts that I, I, I would be happy to develop, but I didn't know if other people had kind of for these last like three three phases of the book, which is a big, a big chunk of the book, were there kind of themes that emerged to you that were most striking? I kind of love that she was pretty transparent around um, how academia really works a lot of the time. I mean, the fact that she actually went ahead and said that, that, you know, you do actually get rewarded in some instances for how good your grant is and like that, I mean, you're, you're spending a lot of time asking for money. I mean, like this is, this is not just like ideas that are held up for the merit of their own and there's just this generative force that lets people continue to do things on top of, you know, there's a lot to unpack there. I mean, you you start to understand. I feel like this book is almost as important for people who don't understand, who don't understand some of the disillusionment that comes from people who've come out of the system, because the arguments that a lot of the commodification of our abilities and how universities fit into a capitalist settler colonial economic system, like we're all being used for something. Why it takes us longer to come around to the fact that that's happening um, is partially explained by some of the aspirational rhetoric around what we apparently are supposed to be doing in these spaces. And for those who get blocked along the way because of things like a racialized identity or other differences in privilege to understand how to navigate the system, you come to that level of disillusionment and understanding of sort of, again, the pragmatic uh, situation of knowledge building in a settler capitalist colonial society comes to you earlier than it does for other people who have an easier time of it. So um, I'm going to stop there because I feel like there's somebody who come, could come up with more itemized uh, things in the book, but I mean, even the chapter on describing persons as dark matter, that one I really thought was important. So I'm going to leave those several pieces of thoughts floating. Yeah, I, well, and this is an idea that she develops throughout, like the, the I, I, I think that there is a decent chance that some folks will read this and they will not be able to get past um, the language of, you know, talking about settler colonialism, talking about, you know, heteronormative things. There's some, there's some people who, to be frank, I think those people probably wouldn't pick up this book to start with. But um, I think there are some people who have a hard time getting past that language to try to really engage with the ideas um, because they see words that, that they're like, I am um, heteronormative. I got told that that was PC political correctness stuff. So I'm not gonna listen to this anymore. Um, but I think, I think part of what's, part of what's, and this is true across many fields is part of what people are trying to do is they're trying to develop a language to talk about what's going on 
in the system that everyone is enmeshed in. Because it's like, it's, it's, it's essentially <laughs> like if you are in a room with a bunch of other people and you're trying to explain to everybody that you're in a room and there's stuff beyond it, they're all just going to go, well, we're just all in this room. I mean, these walls are just the walls that we've got. What are you talking about? There's stuff outside this. So to a degree, I think you've got to develop a language to talk about to give people access to really criticizing and analyzing the system that everyone is completely enmeshed in. And so you have to be able to use some of these words to put a name on things so that you can talk about how things, ideas that are in opposition to those that are just accepted by everybody. And one of the things that I really struck me out of this is, you know, and I've thought about this a little bit, but I don't think I've really thought about it as much as this book prompted me to think is just in academia and in science and this kind of going off of what Nicole was saying, the, the way that we currently practice it is, is colonialism in a way that it's very acquisitive. You know, you have to go out and win a bunch of grant money. You have to go out and, and it's always treated like this, like you're, you're going out to conquer. Like if you get a big grant, then like, yes, like you have, you just plant, plant your flag in something and you're like, that's mine because I got a big grant and I'm gonna do the science in this. And there's oftentimes in, in competitive fields, there can be people chasing each other to publish on something first or to kind of lay claim to an idea first and whose name gets associated with an idea and what are the politics of that? Um, and one who of the gets, things who gets to survive long enough to reshape their narrative in hindsight to make it look like it was more continuous than it actually was. I mean, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and part of what she's asking people to do with this is imagine a different way of doing science. Um, and so one, one of the things that I think, and this is, this is, this is good for me to think about because one of the things I think she talks about is we're, we're kind of, we need to think about ways to move beyond just trying to trying to bring more people into the current system that we practice science in. So rather than saying like, here's the system that we've created out of all the, the, the foundation of colonialism and the ideas of capitalism and so forth, we created this system for producing knowledge. This is our academic system. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to pull marginalized people into this system because that's good that we will then have better representation in this system. And I think what she's trying to say is, no, the system is shit. <laughs> so, so you should really be looking at trying to figure out how to tear apart the system and build a better system that already brings people into it from the beginning rather than trying to like yank people into the existing system. And I think that's part of what happened to her when she went to Harvard is she, she experienced an Ivy League school with all of its you know, pros and cons, which I didn't go to an Ivy League school, so I don't know, but I can only imagine that you're running into all kinds of, you know, long-standing practices and long-standing assumptions that, that shape the way that you learn and then become a knowledge producer in a system like that. So I'm rambling now, so, but, but I feel like that was one of the, one of the things that came out to me from this is just the idea that to some degree, you're going to have to just rebuild the system. Yeah, I agree with you, Laura, and I, I, I agree with the author um, as well, um, because that was um, yeah. one of her main other main points, because like you see it all the time where in universities, they'll, they'll be hiring, like, for instance, um, at our local school here, they're hiring like a new head librarian in the library with preferential hiring towards a BIPOC person, which I think is great, but they still hired like a white guy because he had all the credentials and they didn't get any uh, BIPOC people applying. Um, or if they did, they didn't have, what they said is they didn't have the credentials so we couldn't enact that preferential hiring. But this is a system that has not been accessible to a lot of communities, like the, meaning academia hasn't been accessible. So it's not going, you're not going to find candidates who have a PhD and like two postdocs, or there are, but they're going to be very minimal. You know what I mean? So like you can enact preferential hiring 
But if you don't start to value other types of experience, you're not going to be able to, like, it doesn't matter. Like you're not, so you have to change what you value in that position because the, the academia and a lot of these groups just haven't been accessible to a lot of people. Um, so you can't just say, oh, no, well, now we're going to start recruiting and hiring people if you don't make it so that exactly like you said, you start to value the experiences that a lot of those communities are bringing to the table instead of what tradition, traditionally has been valued. I don't know if I'm making sense, but it like it, you, you, you have to exactly like you said, change what you value in these these academia and other industries like that. Yeah, I think uh, a, a great example I think of that is like pub is public health. Um, I think public health has because I've got I've got a former research student who's she applied to MPH programs and she's got a background where it's like of course you want folks with her perspective in public health in MPH programs in careers in public health. And, you know, she, she got in, but she couldn't afford it. So you're like, well, I don't know what you, I don't know what you expect. She's, she's reapplied this year. So I think, I think she's got a, a good chance of getting in. And I think she's worked some things out, but I, this, I, this idea that, that it's access, but it's also, it's also thinking about what you are, like Luke said, what you're valuing in people, it's recognizing that sometimes the credentialing that we do is, is just hoops that we make people go through to prove that they can fit into the society or the system that already exists. And so if your idea is that this, this, this system that already exists has many, many flaws, you know, you should rethink looking at, did they credential themselves properly in this current system that's kind of shit? Totally. I was gonna, and, and, oh, sorry, go John, ahead, I, I, sorry to interrupt you, John. I'm just going to add one little point to what I was saying. And like, like, I think the response to this is often like, well, we still need um, like qualified candidates or whatever. And I, I hate that because like, for instance, if you're, if you're wanting somebody, like if somebody can speak a, like a traditional indigenous language or is really familiar with living in indigenous communities, they're immensely qualified to be like, again, from my previous example, a, libra a librarian who looks at local history, right? Like they might not have written a thesis on like um, these communities, but they've lived there or it's their own personal culture. They're, they are a qualified candidate. It's just different qualifications than what the university typically looks at. Anyway, I just wanted to add that. Sorry, John. <clears throat> no problem, Luke. <clears throat> I was going to say, commenting on what all three of you have said, that basically everything comes down to money. And Laura, you brought that up with your student. <clears throat> a student needs money in order just to live. A person needs money to live. So then you <clears throat> have to have an occupation where it pays you money in order to follow your dreams or your education and your person who is intelligent and qualified but did not have the money to go to the program, then an institution, unfortunately, um, like an academic institution, gets overly focused on money because now they have physical plant, they have things, they have athletic teams that doesn't even enter into academ academics. But all that is money, it's keeping money. And um, men have traditionally had money more than women and minorities. The other thing I was gonna say along what uh, Luke was talking about with um, broadening how you uh, look at someone's uh, background for getting them into a position. Unfortunately, now when you're hiring people, like even you teaching, you have to have administrative skills. You have to have your knowledge of the subject you're teaching. And now you have to have technical knowledge. So someone, um, if they don't have all those, when they get into the job, there's all these things they have to balance in order to accomplish their task. That's it. 
Yeah, definitely. There's there's lots of um, this is this is something we 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 run across a lot for for people who are on the job market. You know, when I talk to my students who are on the job market, um, you know, the unicorn job posting where they list like all the things that they would ideally want this person to do, and you know, if you're just casually looking at job applications and someone hasn't explained this to you, you would look at that list of things and you'd go, I can't, I can do five of those, five of those 10 I can do. And what a lot of people don't know is it's like, that's, that's a unicorn. That's like a sparkly unicorn with like rainbow tail. Like that person probably does not, if they exist, fantastic, they'll hire them. But if they don't exist, what they've done is just listed. Ideally, we want somebody who can do all of these things, but in their minds, they're probably thinking, probably not gonna get that. So we would like to get people who can do maybe half of these things pretty well, and then we can train them for the other half. But if you, but these are kind of like the idea about being in the system. If you're not, we, we don't really have, particularly in academia, we really don't have a system that is very interested in developing people it's interested in gatekeeping people who have somehow magically figured out how to do it themselves. And the magically figured out part often comes back to who helped you? Why did they help you? What access did they have to resources? You know, I, there are a lot of talented people who have been mistreated very badly by academia and I, it's a tremendous waste of talent. It's a tremendous waste of people's ability. And so, it, I mean, that's, that's a shame for sure. Um, and I think that's a, that's a system, that's the system being shit again. Um, but yeah, I think, and I, how you, mom, you're right. It, it does all come back down to money because we are in a capitalist system. That's the you know, when I was talking about before, all of you are in a room and you're trying to describe to people what it's like outside the room. Like if you're stuck in a capitalist system, it's really, really hard to get around. So at some point it just becomes your walls are made of money. <laughs> you're like, I can't get, I can't get through these money walls uh, because it does, universities are under tremendous financial pressure, you know, but as she mentions in the book, Jeff Bezos can launch himself into space. So that's good, I guess. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're kind of stuck a little bit in, a, in a, a capitalist system, but a very particular kind of capitalist system right now, which I think has lo lost its perspective pretty badly on, on what should be supported and, and how, but. And I was going to say also that yes, we're discussing how this isn't good and there needs to be improvements, but we're allowed to discuss it. So there's some places in the world we wouldn't even be allowed to discuss this. And her book would not get published because it has such controversial ideas in it. So at, we are not in a perfect system, but we are in a system where people can say, I think we need to improve things. Because you know there are countries like Belarus, those people are just being arrested. They don't agree. So it's not, it's certainly not perfect but at least we are allowed to say, hey, these things need to be improved and slowly, hopefully work away at getting them improved. Yeah, I, yes, that's true. Um, there are definitely places where, where your ability to, to discuss alternatives to this current system is, is extremely curtailed um, and people's, people are threatened because of that. Um, yeah, so I... I it's interesting because it's it as as I think was the intention. It's made me think a little bit about what it is that I can do because you're always operating within the constraints of your system. I mean that's that's a thing that I think uh, is a lesson I've I've tried to absorb because uh, it, you just hurt yourself if you try to completely change the system from within. I think that gets very very difficult. So you kind of have to. It's a pick your battles kind of thing. Um, but I've been thinking about, you know, in the various roles that I have, some of which involves, uh, as an example, we have a lot of students interested in research and I've got a limited number of spots that I can feasibly mentor people and, and not have it all go off the rails. So there's always more people interested in doing research in a lab than are available spots. 
And that means I've now got a scarcity, right? And so I have to think about how I, my system of who do I choose? How do I help them develop? You know, so forth. And so I try to avoid doing the credentialing because we, as we talked about, that's, that's a extended problem as you get through academia is this idea that, you know, that you want the person to be developed beyond the stage that you are recruiting them for, because then they'll be really great for you. And it's like, that's not, that's not a development mentality. It's not a mentality that says like, you know, we're going to take people based on their interest and their enthusiasm and, you know, their willingness to do the work. And then you're going to say, okay, now, now we will develop you because that's, that's the goal of this. Um, so I'm trying to avoid being acquisitive in my, I'm saying acquisitive rather than inquisitive. I don't know if I'm articulating that well. I'm trying to avoid being acquisitive in the way that I recruit and train research students because I don't want to try to just pick the people who I think are going to, oh, these people are definitely going to work really hard and produce results for me because that's not my main goal. My main goal is to try to help people develop. And so I have to think think about how I, how I do that process. Um, yeah. I don't know. Nicole, do you have any thoughts on this? I'm sure you do. Yeah. Um, it's, I mean, the fact that hiring somebody who diverges from the experience of who's established and at the top and making these decisions is inherently generative, right? They have to bring new perspectives. They're seeing another facet of their interaction with the world that people who just stay in the same place with the same agendas don't. And the systems are not set up to grow anything from that novelty. And I mean, there are, I mean, universities do do new in initiatives, but they are, they're largely contrived and they, you know, they work with people who have the connections they have. There's no, I mean, real discovery is in some respects, you know, taking, I don't want to say the gamble because like there's a negative connotation of risk, but actually like looking at what can develop out of a person's less common experience with the support, financial, stable work environment to like refine their craft, a set of consistent interactions with peers and resources to give them give them the tools to develop their expertise at looking at the world the way they do. I mean, that is what would truly be creative. And like, that's not, I, I think when I was younger, I thought that that's what these institutions supported. And now I, I understand that a little more clearly. Um, one of the things that I find quite fascinating about this book, and I, and I shouldn't because of the world we live in, but like the last one third of it is kind of devoted to climate change. I mean, it's a problem that a very limited strata of socioeconomic privilege has generated, except that we're all screwed. So the fact that it's probably going to take a number of global perspectives to understand what will be appropriate community care and facilitating survival given the inherent climactic and geographical heterogeneity of the planet itself as well as the differences in people kind of in and of itself is an interesting way to sort of cap the book because homogeneity is not going to save us from this well save whatever it is that's going to be savable right so um yeah it's it's uh it's also just been interesting to see dr prescott weinstein's perspectives on people who see totalitarianism and fascism in you know american north america and settler canada north america as a novelty instead of understanding that these were walls that other people can see the whole time because they weren't walls that were imposing pressure on them so you know, that prompt for understanding um, systemic inequity and the trajectories that those systems drive people to in terms of marginalization and, and the termini in terms of who gets to be thriving, who gets to ensure their own survival of a community. It's, it's quite selective and it's quite sharp.
Yeah, um, that was well said, Nicole. Um, the, the, the discussion of climate change was particularly interesting because it, there's always that element of, well, where technology is gonna save us. And so physics has been at the, at the core of a lot of technological advancements. And she makes the point that, you know, that kind of advancement, that technological advances, advancement also gave us the bomb. So it, it's, up to, it's up to us to try to figure out, you know, and at some point she says this, she's like, the, the moral arc of the universe bends because people bend it. It doesn't just bend on its own. That's not a physics principle. It's not a law. You know, you, there has to be work done. Um, yeah, I, I, we're coming up on an hour, so which went by really fast, actually. Um, so I think I think I don't want to go too long to respect people's time. There's there's a lot in here. I would really, for anyone watching, I would really invite you to to definitely read this and and take some time to kind of think about what she's saying. Um, I think I'm going to ask for folks' closing thoughts. I think my closing thought on this is. Um, I think a, a better system would be a system in which she would write a book like this and not have the fear that she very clearly does that it's gonna damage her career. I'm glad that she wrote this book. I definitely think that the system may attempt to punish her for it. She knows that, she acknowledges it, she wrote it anyway. My hope is that we get to a point that we have a system where a, writing a book like this is something that uh, lots of people feel empowered to do in order to share their perspective and think about ways to improve things. So I'm glad she wrote it. I'm glad I read it. Uh, it's got a lot for me to think about in there, much of which we, we didn't end up covering. There's a lot There's a lot in there. There's some important stuff about who is a scientist that I'm definitely going to still continue to think about. Um, but yeah, it's a very, very, very valuable book to read. Um, other closing thoughts from folks? I think also as part of a systems and systems are big, a better system would be one where this book exists in the world. And the people kind of approached it with the understanding that you can have a career that takes you into some very privileged spaces that you are lucky to exist within and still um, kind of have to be, or, or you know, have oppressive forces imposed against you within those systems. The, these juxtapositions of privilege and things you have to fight against do exist. On top of the interesting part at the end where I think she sort of realizes her mother who actually has a, a long career of activism to understand, you know, the intellectual discipline of being able to organize, as you said, people are what bend trajectories of history and social equity. It's, it's, not, it's not these physical phenomena that have shaped her intellectual interest. So I think to see her kind of draw that together with experiences that she didn't quite understand when she was younger, but understanding why they matter now is also pretty cool. Moms are always doing, doing the hard work. <laughs> Moms are trying to do the hard work. They're, they're trying to do the best they can as they go along. Um, I was gonna say, I'm glad she had the courage to write this book. So yes, I thought it was very, uh, very interesting and lots of different perspectives. And it's nice that her mother had all that energy to do that, ending up being a single mother. Because sometimes it's hard to um, do those things when you don't have support and you're trying to support yourself and then develop a child. So that's, that's my thought. Yeah, I I and I agree with everything everyone else said, and I I just really enjoyed this book. I thought it was a really good pick. Excellent. Well, well, thanks everybody for for being here. I did it did go by really fast. Hopefully, I didn't uh, spend most of that yapping myself. I had a lot of thoughts about this book, so I clearly needed to get them out. Um, so that was the disordered cosmos. Our book for August is going to be the jazz of physics. Uh, it's available in a paperback, a hardcover, an audio book, which is one of, it was one of the top vote getters. And I went with that one because of its broader availability. So I think, uh, I think hopefully everybody would, will be able to get a hold of that. 
I believe if I remember right, the author also lives in Providence. So I thought, well, there you go. That works. Um, so our August book is going to be The Jazz of Physics. Um, and I hope that folks can join us for that then. So in the meantime, I'm going to end the recording here and wave at folks. So thanks very much. And 